Hello everyone, this is Sherry. Welcome to my channel. If you're new, I am a software engineer working in the game industry and today's video will be focused on my first day of my first week in my new job. And I want to keep it relatively educational. So if you're curious about, okay, what does a game developer do working on a project with a team of people, right? Um, I am going to show you my exact working hours and the tools that I use on a daily basis to accomplish my work. I did wake up at 5 a.m. this morning um, because most of my colleagues are on the Eastern Standard Time and I live here in Washington. So I do need to wake up early to meet the core working hours of the team. Let's start the day, shall we? For my work laptop, I use uh, M2 Max. This is 32 gigabyte of memory and one terabyte of storage. Do I need an M2 Max? Probably not. But I think because I'm a new employee, they just issued a new laptop to me. I get to test it out, I guess. Well, for reference, I do have a personal laptop that's M1, uh, 16 gigabyte of memory and one terabyte of storage. I use this for traveling and video editing. Um, I didn't go for M1 Max and top spec because I don't expect to do any game development with it. The major advantage of 14 inch is that it is lightweight. 16 inch is way too heavy for me, so this size is perfect. So from 7.30 to 11 a.m., I am in all sorts of meetings. Now, it's a lot of meeting for a day. I definitely get that, but it is the first day. So I had a lot of meeting with HR. I need to onboard with IT. I need to onboard with my team. And I need to have some one-on-one -on -one conversations with either my manager or the team lead. The way that I approach first week at a new company is that you should use this time to really understand the context. The context of the culture of your team as well as company, because sometimes those could be two very different things. Based off of that information, you can start building relationship with people around you or start taking on tasks that can solve real life problems. A mistake that I always make as a junior engineer years ago is that I like to work on tasks that are easy, right? I treat it as my personal to-do list. I find the easiest task and I finish them. But that mindset is detrimental because you should always be working on tasks based on their prioritization or else you'll be grinding the easy tasks day after day without really getting to the meaningful projects that not only get you promotion, but also really grow you technically as an engineer. I bought these books before my new job started because I intend to get better at these areas. So the first book is Working Effectively with Legacy Code. And the second book is Refactoring, Improving the Design of Existing Code. Essentially, I want to focus on software architecture and, and really get to know some of the better practices and logical steps toward refactoring right, or redesign of the code base. I do plan to share more of my favorites and talk about just stuff that I learned from whatever educational materials that I come across. Subscribe if you are curious about those. Oh, and I did buy some non-tech related books just for personal curiosity. The first one is In the Blink of an Eye. I want to read a book about film editing. If you watch any of my videos, you realize that I have a lot of editing styles. I'm still exploring. Um, for me, YouTube is a lot about, I want to be creative with my work. And the next book is Man, Woman, and Chainsaws. It's a theoretical film book about the genre of horror. 
This afternoon, I focused on setting up my development environment and examining the code for our game. My development setup is Mac, and there are three main apps that I frequently switch between. Unity, Rider, and Tower. Tower is my GUI for Git. It has become an industry standard, so knowing Git is crucial if you want to land a developer job. As for Unity, I admit that I don't spend as much time tweaking prefabs or working inside of the engine itself. Instead, my focus lies more on feature-oriented development and C-sharp programming. Writer is my preferred editor when it comes to writing C-sharp code. Additionally, whenever coding in C-sharp, I always have C-sharp in depth by my side, which is a book that has proven to be invaluable as a reference tool, offering comprehensive answers on various subjects. Now that my development environment is set up properly, it's time to dive deeper into the code and collaborate with team members regarding our game project. This is slightly silly, but I decided to just Google like game dev team. What are some of the most popular answers for what a game dev team should look like? Anyway, let's take a look at this. What is this? Oh, this is, all right. I think I found the source for the image producer on top. And then we have what looks like developers that's focused on programming, developers on designing, artists, and animators. Okay, and then at the bottom we have QA, middleware programmer, audio, and outsource. Producer is different from like a team leader, right? Producer doesn't own the product. Producer does different things at different teams but based on my experience, they tend to be the enabler of everyone else. You know, they push the deadline, they help manage the project in terms of uh, sprint planning and such. So a good producer clears obstacles and they're really crucial in a game team. Um, as a programmer, uh, you have junior, um, I guess entry-level programmer, senior and technical manager. Yeah, depending on the company, you know, these ladders can get really sophisticated or very simple. Um, same thing with design. Now, the interesting thing about design is that I've never actually been on a team where there are multiple levels of designer. I've been on teams where there is a level designer and a game designer, you know, they do different things. And one thing I do want to call out is a lot of the designers in the industry is actually really technical. Uh, they're very well-rounded. They're really good with Unity and they can do both art and programming. A major reason for why that's the case is because a lot of them has past histories of doing QA or they switch career from programmers, engineers to designer, or they switch career from 3D artists to designer. So, you know, it's always very interesting to talk to designers because they have, they're just jack of all trades and they're really good at what they do. Um, okay, in terms of artists, from what I've experienced, I tend to see more senior artists being a lot more technical. Like for example, they know Houdini, they know uh, shader, you know, materials very well. So I guess that comes with a lot of experiences. Okay, animators and technical artists, it depends on the team, really. Like sometimes when you're working on a UI heavy, you may not have a technical artist, but instead you have UI or UX designers. Or on a team where there is not a TA, sometimes what happens is that engineers become the TA. QA is so important. It's just invaluable for gaming. I mean, if you play any games, you would know there are so many bad news or bad examples out there of games just being out with bug. The way that I see it is that I don't think it's QA's fault. I don't think it's developer's fault. I think it is utterly capitalism being extremely egoistic, right? They just want quick cash grab. They know they're going to get backlash from the gamers, but they don't care because guess what? They can get the money and that's all they care about. Every game studio and every game I've worked on had outsourced some of its production. Sometimes it is audio design. Other times it is uh, maybe even game features, like you can outsource a whole section of the game programming to like an outside team. And really being in the game industry is a highly collaborative work. Before I officially end the day, I do want to talk to you guys about the crunch culture or lack thereof. Admittedly, I did work 10 hours. Now, by the time I'm editing this video, 
my entire first week has passed and I will give you the official data that I recorded for my first week. I worked 10 hours on Monday, 7 hours on Tuesday, 10 hours on Wednesday. I personally think being in the game industry as an engineer, you will have infinite amount of work, right? There's always more tasks and backlog. And sometimes you even have to sort of marinate an idea in your head, right, for hours before you actually get to a solution. This is what happened to me on Wednesday. I would, now, do I consider that overworking? Some people might say that's overworking, right? You're working 10 hours, right? You're getting paid for, you know, eight hours per day. My personal philosophy towards this concept is that I'm getting paid eight hours a day to solve problems. In a sense, I care about whether or not Am I growing as an engineer so that I'm solving more complicated problems? Part of me treats the time that I'm spending on solving problems as personal development. But also, I am very conscious of the amount of time that I spend working instead of doing other things or developing personal interests or just plain, right, relax. So what I usually do is on days that I have a light load, you know, I will sign off when it's seven hours, knowing that I have worked more on the previous day the way that i see it is that it only gets really toxic when you're constantly overworking sometimes even when you're not overworking the stress can really kill you like i totally get it i've burned out you know many times in my career short career so far so treat yourself nicely develop habits that serve you and not the company okay so with that being said, this is the end of the video. Thank you so much for watching. I love you guys and hope you subscribe so I can see you next time. Bye-bye.